Thanks very much. Uh, the questions at the end, obviously. Uh, next talk is from Professor Michael Hoffman, entitled "How I Select Patients." Thanks, Mark, and thanks, Aravind. Yeah, so this talk is going to be about our Peter Mac experience and how we select patients for our lutetium PSMA therapy. Uh, here are some disclosures. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, imaging uh, in the first part of the talk and then touch on some clinical factors. And as many of you will know, we've been using a lot of FDG PET in addition to PSMA PET for selecting uh, patients, which is quite different than, let's say, the US or even most of Europe or even some centres in Australia that don't use a lot of FDG PET. And uh, Declan and I were part of this Advanced Prostate Cancer consensus conference meeting back in 2019 in uh, Basel. The 2022 meeting's coming up in four weeks' time. It's going to be the, our first overseas trip in like two and a half years, I think. So we're looking forward to that. But we did take a vote on this issue back in 2019. Uh, which imaging do you recommend to select patients for lutetium PSMA therapy? And uh, this was a panel consisting of 50 people, mainly from a medical oncology background, but really quite mixed, radonc, uh, urology, uh, all so-called key opinion leaders. And at the time, 60% of people said both a PSMA PET and an FDG PET, which was uh, quite surprising. And this was what they considered was optimal, not necessarily what was available to them, but it was a question about what do you think is optimal for patient care? Uh, since 2019, we've got the two randomised control trials that uh, Aravind has just taken us through, and they took patient selection quite differently. So our own ANZ UP therapy trial on the left, published in The Lancet uh, last year, used PSMA PET and FDG PET, and we'll go through this in a bit more detail, whereas the Novartis Vision trial just used PSMA PET and both used different thresholds. So the Australian trial excluded around 30% after imaging. The vision trial excluded around uh, 10%. So uh, roughly 20% difference in that exclusion. And our response rate were roughly 20% higher. PSA response rate over 50% was 66% in the therapy trial compared to 46% in the vision trial. Uh, so one way to read that is that the patients that we deselected actually didn't benefit all that much uh, and we just enriched our response rate and you know the true answer is probably somewhere in between those two. So here's a bit of the detail. In the therapy trial we used a quantitative PET parameter SUV max over 20 at a single site of disease and then if there were soft tissue measurable sites they had to have an SUV over 10 and we used FDG PET to help identify these PSMA negative sites. Whereas the vision trial used contrast enhanced CT in combination with the PSMA PET. Uh, you had to have a PSMA intensity above liver at one site, which is an SUV of around five to seven. Both trials used gallium PSMA. And if you had a soft tissue measurable site on the CT, that's, that's a lymph node over two and a half centimeters or a visceral metastasis over one centimeter and it had uptake less than liver, then you were excluded. So let's look at an example. Is this patient suitable for lutetium PSMA? 66-year-old, metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, post-docetaxel, post-enzalutamide. Looks like very high uptake on the PSMA PET. SUV max is 22. Uh, looks suitable for both therapy. Looks suitable for vision. However, in therapy, we did the addition of an FDG PET. This is the same patient actually scanned on the same day. We can do the gallium PSMA in the morning. FDG in the afternoon, and we see a lot more disease. We can colour code that and see that there is a lot of FDG positive PSMA negative disease. And we know from our neuroendocrine tumour experience uh, that these patients tend to do badly with lutathera or lutetium dotatate because the disease that we can't target, unfortunately, is the most aggressive disease, the disease that's growing fastest. And if we can't target that, we're not going to do well and we get these fantastic images. And if we deep dive on the uh, CT, we can see that although this lesion in the bone is PSMA negative, FDG positive, it's invisible on the CT, so it's not measurable. So without the FDG, these bone metastases, we just can't see them. And prostate cancer likes spreading to bone. Here's another case uh, of a patient with lymph node metastases where it's got intensity just above liver in this subcarinal node and in this abdominal node really no uptake 
by the vision criteria, this patient would probably just be suitable. The uptake's above liver, the abdominal nodes below that 2.5 centimetre threshold. Uh, so it would be suitable uh, for vision, but not suitable for therapy. Uh, in therapy, we would have done the FDG as well, and it highlights that abdominal node very nicely, FDG positive, PSMA negative, and really just helps us identify all these lymph nodes. And I'm pretty confident that this is patient would not benefit from lutetium PSMA. The uptake's just too low, and you're not going to get a meaningful response. Even apart from patient selection, knowing the true extent of disease is really critical for decision making. Here's another patient with a uh, you know, bone and lymph node metastases, and again, color coding it. So in red, we've got the PSMA uh, negative FDG positive disease, and we can see one in the cervical spine. That would be missed if you didn't have the FDG PET because you can't see it on the CT and you can't see it on the PSMA PET. And this is a therapy trial candidate and they were excluded from the trial on the basis of this. And about three weeks uh, after this scan, the patient progressed and had cord compression due to that FDG positive lesion progressing. So these aggressive sites of disease, in our experience, tend to be the ones that are clinically significant and it's good to know about them early on because you can intervene this patient just being aware of that you would take a more directed history do you have any leg weakness change in sensation in your feet potentially identify clinical cord compression early and potentially giving some external beam proactively rather than waiting for that cord compression to occur so knowing the true state of a disease enables you to make better decisions for your patients we now have some imaging biomarker data from the therapy study and uh, we'll be deep diving on this tomorrow so I'm not going to go in any detail uh, on this but if you had super high PSMA expression uh, this is from a contour of all the PSMA of a disease and that was defined by an SUV mean over 10 uh, and you were randomized to the lutetium PSMA arm you had a 91% likelihood of responding to the treatment. So by looking at four predictive biomarkers, uh, we can potentially identify patients that are extremely likely to benefit from this treatment. How you use this in clinical practice remains a little bit uncertain because uh, in the therapy cohort, really the overall group did better with lutetium than carbazitaxel. But in many places, the treatment's not yet available, but there's a group of patients that really ought to try and find access to lutetium PSMA. And the top 30% of PSMA expressors in the therapy cohort really had remarkable responses. And they're probably that group that Aravind showed are extending this, the uh, progression-free survival curve. It's that group out at 12 months that aren't progressing. This has also been looked at in a multi-center cohort that we did together with our American colleagues from UCLA and Germany, I uh, don't know if you were involved in this as well, Tom, uh, where we looked at the tumor SUV mean, uh, also using these quantitative whole body tumor contours, and we plugged it into a normogram, and it could predict for, or at least prognosticate, for both overall survival and uh, response rates. But patient selection is more than just imaging. We've been talking about imaging to date, so in the last three minutes we're going to talk about clinical factors because that's really critically important and in this way therapy and vision were fairly similar uh, in both studies patients had progressed after docetaxel and in both studies really patients had progressed after androgen receptor pathway inhibitors either enzalutamide abiraterone or that sort of drugs so that's a third line indication for lutetium psma and that's what the fda label now says and you know we really shouldn't be using it earlier than this except in some exceptional circumstances that we'll go through. Uh, you have to have, you know, reasonably good, you know, normal hematologic, renal and liver function, or at least not really bad function. Uh, and that was pretty similar between vision and therapy. Vision trial, interestingly, excluded patients with a super scan that we didn't do in therapy. And uh, from clinical trial to clinical practice, we now do offer off-trial access to lutetium PSMA at Peter Mack and we've developed our own guidelines and they're a little bit between therapy and vision. So we're still using a quantitative PET threshold but rather than SUV Max 20 from the uh, therapy trial we've looked at vision and uh, which used above liver and we think that's a bit low so we've gone a little in, bit in between and we want an SUV Max over 15. We still use FDG routinely, we think it's really helpful 
And you can see our clinical criteria there. Again, the photographers in the audience can take a picture of that. But there are a group of men that are unfit for chemotherapy where Mark sees the patient and goes, they're 80, they're just not suitable for docetaxel. Michael, please, please give this patient lutetium. I don't care what the vision trial says. I don't care what the therapy trial says. This patient's not suitable for chemotherapy but will benefit from lutetium PSMA therapy. So we try to do this objectively and... Uh, We've developed some criteria where we can use some objective scores. Uh, again, take a photo of this, but these are some uh, websites you can go to. There's a CARG, CARG, C A R G, toxicity score. If you get over 10, it means you're not suitable for chemotherapy. There's a frailty score from a geriatric G8 health status screening. Clearly, if you're ECOG 2 or worse, or you have bad liver function, or you happen to have peripheral neuropathy, you're not a chemotherapy candidate. But if it's just the patient saying, look, I don't want chemotherapy because I've read about it and it's nasty, but they're healthy and fit, we don't give them lutetium. We say, unfortunately, the evidence base is that you will do better with docetaxel chemotherapy. We have no evidence to yet support lutetium being superior to docetaxel. So if you're fit for chemotherapy, you should have chemotherapy first. So some take-home messages. Uh, lutetium PSMA, as it stands today, is really a third-line treatment option, post-androgen receptor pathway inhibitor, post-taxane chemotherapy. Uh, we use PSMA PET to select patients for the treatment. Uh, the vision and therapy criteria is a little bit different. Perhaps the vision criteria is too low. Therapy might be a bit high. The optimal may be somewhere in between. But response rate does increase with increasing PSMA intensity FDG PET is critically useful to identify patients that are unlikely to benefit from treatment or at least to be aware of sites that we can't target. And we should do this as a close collaboration. We work really closely with our medical oncology colleagues to really select patients. We discuss everyone in a multidisciplinary team meeting. So with that, thank you very much.